1931, the date of that recording, now on Music Memoria, with Henri Busser conducting the orchestra and chorus of the Paris Opera. And at least they're all enjoying themselves. And at least, and this isn't so common in modern recordings, the chorus is placed well forward in the recording balance. The main attraction of this set, or at any rate why it's highly valued in some knowledgeable quarters, is that its Mephistopheles is Marcel Journet. He was by then in his sixties, a highly distinguished bass from the Caruso era, and even a little before. It had a rather special tenor, too, a Corsican, César Vezzani, a singer with unusual body and ring in his voice. <laughs> There was Marcel Journet as Mephistopheles answering Faust's call with fine panache. And for a 63 or 64 year old man, there's a remarkable range there from the high F thrown in as a bit of traditional swagger, down an octave and a half to the low B-flat. Now, it'd be a pleasure to say that this 1931 recording, and these two singers in particular, set a standard that modern times would do well to observe, etc., etc. But that would be true only up to a point. The performance as a whole is nothing special. The rest of the cast are very average, the style unremarkable either for elegance or imaginative involvement. And even the Faust and Mephistopheles are distinguished only in part. Journet is by no means a sure model of legato singing. He uses aspirates in his solos where they make things easier, and he characterises his Mephistopheles with as many belly laughs as the next man. Vetsani, the tenor, so magnificent in that passage, is hopeless when it comes to presenting Faust as a lover. He treats Marguerite with little more tenderness than he does Mephistopheles, and his address to her chaste dwelling carries no sense of enchantment, or indeed of any expression at all. His top C isn't really very good either. Now, here's a tenor who does catch the enchantment. <laughs> Jussi Bierling. This is a live performance from the Metropolitan Opera New York, given on the 19th of December, 1959, and the great tenor was within less than a year of his lamented death. He sang once more in the house, three days later in Cavalleria Rusticana, and never again. <laughs> Oh, 
Well, it's very fine. I hardly like to mention it, but there must be some of you who are saying, like Hans Sachs in Die Meistersinger, you ended in a different key. And that's true. It's not the fault of the recording. At one of the modulations earlier on, an ingenious little side slip was arranged, and the second half is down a semitone so that the top C becomes a B. Never mind, it's a very fine one. And it's part of an inspired performance that Björling gives here. The young Elizabeth Söderström is Marguerite, not quite so charming as one might have expected, but still good. Cesare Siepi, a very experienced, effective Mephistopheles. Robert Merrill, an exceptionally resonant Valentin. And the sensitive conducting by Jean Morel. There's also a lot of coughing, a December afternoon in New York. And there are the usual hazards of live recording when characters move backstage. But the occasion is special, and I certainly wouldn't want to be without it. I was playing from a transfer on the Music and Arts label. Another live performance I must give you a taste of comes from Tokyo, though the cast is a familiar Western one, with Nikolai Gyaurov as Mephistopheles, the most frequently recorded of all interpreters of the role. The Faust and Marguerite, on the other hand, can't, as far as I know, be heard in their parts on any other recording, and they're a distinguished couple, sometimes almost exquisite. Alfredo Kraus and Renata Scotto in part of the love duet. And I can imagine that live in the theatre it would probably have been two minutes of sheer magic. Kraus isn't always the impeccable stylist, and Scotto isn't really at home in Marguerite's jewel song, and there's rather inconsistent conducting by Paul Etouin, who seems to be rigid and indulgent by turns. The date is September 1973, and the record label is called Standing Room Only. Now, talking of sopranos being at home or not in the jewel song, how about this? Peter! 
Well, I don't know what her mirror tells her, but the score says non from the start. And that little flutter on the first note is apparently the best she can do by way of a trill, and the various other rather self-conscious devices employed later don't make up for it. Montserrat Caballé, in what is probably the most readily dismissible of these recordings, and it's on Erato. Actually, we must be fair, she sometimes sings quite beautifully, and the Faust is the very pleasing Giacomo Aragal. But it's an uneven performance vocally, with the Mephistopheles, a somewhat routine job by Paul Plischka, and Alain Lombard conducts his Strasbourg forces oh so slowly, every moderato turned into an andante, every andante into an adagio. It also has a notably inadequate Valentin, Philippe Hutzenlocher, and good Valentins are certainly to be found. Here's one of them. One of the most finely textured of baritone voices there, Andreas Schmidt. He's excellent throughout, with an appropriate youthful freshness in his tone, which, despite its German origin and training, is so well defined and even in production that it admirably suits the French idiom. He's one of an adventurously assembled cast for the 1986 Philips recording, made in Munich under Sir Colin Davis. I hadn't looked at the cast list for the smaller roles before listening, but noted a better-than-usual Wagner, and then an absolutely splendid Martha, and consulting the booklet came up with the names of Gilles Cachemai, one of the most reliable of modern French singers, and Mariana Lipovshek, no less. But this is a special Faust, not so much for the singing of its principles as for the work of the conductor and his players. Now, Faust, as I was saying at the start, is not just an opera of good tunes, though, heaven knows, the gift for writing good tunes is not something to belittle. But it's also musically rather better integrated than one might think, and it's an opera where any number of in-between passages, introductions, postludes, and so on, have a beauty of their own once you've noticed them, and Davis makes you notice. There's usually something, whether in the shading or the phrasing, the balancing of the instruments, where this recording is treasurable. Very briefly, let me find one or two examples. For instance, the prelude to the garden scene, where evil lurks, but where a most delicious breeze stirs in the leaves, and the evening sunlight glows before other shadows pass. Beautifully painted, that. Or take that literally magical effect where Mephistopheles, having proposed the health of the company, refuses the plonk they're drinking and summons some supernatural wine from Bacchus himself. Hola, Seigneur Bacchus, à boire. Service, 
Again, beautifully done. It's always vivid, that effect, but here it's painted with a particularly fine hand. That leads to the splendid Seine des Epées, where the cross of the swords is turned towards Mephistopheles. The Strasbourg chorus sings well, and then hear how strong Davis makes the orchestral bars that follow. Now, of course, that strong, broad, melodious writing, it can't very well fail. But Davis gives that little touch that infuses energy, where with most it's just solidity. It's located in that dotted figure, ta-ta, the punctuation, as it were. There's a great deal in this performance, and I'll be coming back to it. But we have three others now, which, in spite of the great talents gathered together in all of them, are, I think, more ordinary, at any rate in their perceptions. You don't find subtleties of that kind, for instance, in this 1979 EMI recording under Georges Prêtre, though it is plentifully rich and generous in sound, and very good, for instance, in this sort of thing. It's a lovely old piece, and a shame to stop it, but duty must be done. We must go on, for instance, to look at the cast, which is as opulent as any. Domingo, Gaurov again, Freni as Marguerite, and Thomas Allen as Valentin. Domingo, Allen, and Giaurov there, in the dual trio, 
with Thomas Allen singing very beautifully the solo in which Valentin throws away his charm, the mascot given to him by Marguerite. As you heard, Pretre keeps a firm hold, and he doesn't neglect the rhythmic spring in the accompaniment of that solo. The recording is very resonant, which suits much of the opera well. It has the authentic feel of the Paris opera, the old Paris opera, that is. Domingo, so often taken for granted, shouldn't be. His isn't a French-sounding voice, but he brings a strong heroic edge to the more strenuous passages and is scrupulously lyrical and tender in the love music. The Marguerite of Mirella Freni is also enjoyable, though ideally we should have had her in the part just a few years earlier. But her voice is still crystal clear, and we never get from her the moony, droopy manner that afflicts Joan Sutherland in the Decca recording originally issued in it's unkind to play that, for there are things Dame Joan does a great deal better. But then much of Marguerite's role is of that kind, rather than being in the brilliant manner of the jewel song. That is, for most of the time it's a lyric soprano role, and it needs from the singer a firm, cleanly drawn vocal line, which, as you heard, it tends not to get here. It's a rather curiously assorted cast, with the statutory East European Mephistopheles in Giaurov, the Italian Franco Corelli, who might not be expected to make a very idiomatic Faust, and a solitary Frenchman among the principals, Robert Massard. His Valentin has been much admired, but not greatly by me. It's the right kind of high baritone, but dull in tone and expression. And although we've got a funny mixture of accents here, and his comes from no further afield than Po in the south of France, I nevertheless find certain of his vowels, mostly those on E or An, nag in my ears more insistently than the cosmopolitan collection from Italy, Bulgaria and the Antipodes. As for Corelli, well, perhaps you should hear him before I say anything. Here he is in that verse of the love duet we heard sung earlier by Alfredo Krauss. Well, is not such a world apart from Krauss there, is he? Krauss, who's so generally thought of as the stylist in such music. Corelli, like Krauss, accomplishes quite a beautiful diminuendo on the high A, and he caresses the phrases, probably with warmer affection, certainly with warmer tone. 
Mind, it's not really all that satisfactory. Why, for instance, take a breath between Les Semois Contemplés and the object, ton visage? That's in the repetition of the words. And I don't really see why, except with an Italian tenor, the contemplation of the visage should induce those, well, what to call them, they're not quite sobs, soblets, perhaps. Anyway, better that than emptiness. And the voice of itself provides the real seduction here. And it's time we saluted Giaurov, here now for the third time as Mephistopheles. We'll have him in his kingdom, in his palace on Valpurgis night, in tip-top company, with Cleopatra and Lace of the lovely brow, and a chorus of girls to remind him that there's no place like home. Mephistopheles at home in the Hartz Mountains. It's the scene with the ballet, not always given in live performances, but included in all studio recordings nowadays. That 1966 recording on Decker under Richard Bonning was the first to incorporate a whole lot of extra material, including a sad and rather beautiful song for Marguerite at the spinning wheel. And it's also there in the new recording under Michel Plasson, along with various other bits and pieces compiled in an appendix. Plasson's version has a lot going for it, not least the three American singers among those heading the cast list. The title roles taken by Richard Leach, and there's Cheryl Studer, a Marguerite who copes well with all aspects of this very demanding role, and the excellent Thomas Hampson as Valentin, who here lies a dying. Merci, merci de vos J'ai vu fort bleu, la bonne en face trop souvent pour en avoir peur. Ma grille, ma soeur, que me veux-tu? Ma Je me. pages these are, right at the serious heart of the opera. It's the tragedy of brother and sister that moves us, and that moved the composer. Faust's own tragedy is rather lost to sight. This isn't in any way a counterpart of Marlowe's play, yet it starts out that way. Let me bring you, in this new EMI recording, back to the beginning of it all, to Faust's call for Mephistopheles. Here's Richard Leach as Faust. <laughs> Que faut-il pour moi? Me rendra-t-il l'amour? 
la jeunesse et la foi. Maudite, soyez-vous, aux politesses humaines, maudite soit la chaîne qui me font ramper ici bas. Maudite soit tout ce qui nous l'a. Maudite la science, la prière et la foi. Maudite sois-tu, patience, amour Satan, amour. Richard Leach in the New Faust under Michel Plasson. Now, I don't really think this is a recording that has much insight, personal involvement or individuality about it. It does the right sort of thing, as you heard there with Richard Leach, getting some agitation into his delivery, but it's nominal. He isn't really, with his voice, dramatising an embittered man who curses everything he's lived for, and then finally, cursing patience itself, rushes to the one thing left, which is the devil. I'm going to contrast now Francisco Arisa's performance in the Colin Davis set. I don't at all recommend this as singing, but it has a dramatic reality and involvement that goes well beyond anything in this new set. You caught there the real Faust, the man already in touch with evil, the spirit that denies, who curses God before his face and runs headlong to Satan. He's not playing at it. In the new recording, the voice of the devil who answers Faust's call is this. Ta surprise, ne suis-je pas mis à ta guise? L'épée au côté, la plume au chapeau, l'escarcelle pleine, un riche manteau sur l'épaule. Now again, that's all right. It's musical, it's tasteful. It's José Van Damme, which of itself is a guarantee of many good qualities. But he's a grey figure, both vocally and dramatically, and he's grey throughout. There's not much presence in his me voici, not much panache to accompany that dashing figure with the sword at his side, the plume in his hat, and the flourishing downward scale with which he introduces himself as un vrai gentilhomme, which isn't the same as an English gentleman. Now, when Mephistopheles appears on records, I want a presence, and I want command and colour, and I don't care tuppence that his accent may proclaim that the devil's homeland is Bulgaria, at least not if he has a voice like this. Bon. 
d'où vient ta surprise Ne suis-je pas mis à ta guise Les pères aux côtés, la plume au chapeau L'escarcelle pleine, un riche manteau sur l'épaule En somme, un vrai gentil Boris Christoph, and that's the voice of the Mephistopheles for me, Gounod's Mephistopheles, who is not some self-effacing grey friar, but a swaggering extrovert roisterer with a power of turning nasty in church, which Christoph does in a superb performance of the church scene. He's part of an earlier EMI recording from 1959 that still sounds extremely well. It's under André Cuitance with the Paris Opera again, but with much more individuality in it than Pretre, or to my mind, than Plasson. It has Nikolai Geda and Victoria de Los Angeles, both excellent and far more vivid as characters than their modern counterparts. There's a good French Valentin in Ernest Blanc, and a quite charming Siebel too, and that's my recommendation for enjoyment. But let me cover this a little. I said for enjoyment, not for absolute completeness. The spinning solo isn't there, for instance. Or for absolutely up-to-date recording. If you want those, then, all things considered, the new Plasson version is probably the best modern recording. Though I wouldn't want to be without the Colin Davis. It is flawed. I wouldn't go to it for the singing of Tekanawa or Arisa or Nesterenko. It's also sometimes too slow. But it does open your ears. It's the thinking man's Faust by which I mean woman's too. Anyway, for me and for pleasure, it's this, the 1959 Cretance, which also means the Victoria de Los Angeles of those days. Here she is in that lovely first meeting with Faust, saying no in the nicest possible way. And we'll take the example on a little further with Gedda, an ardent and stylish Faust, Christoph always a presence, even when he hasn't much to say. There, you see, that's another of those tunes, half forgotten and totally enchanting. Part of a delightful scene and a delightful performance, with Geda, Christoph, and Los Angeles, the most charming, poignant Marguerite. André Cutance conducts the Paris Opera Chorus and Orchestra in a recording from 1959, which has evidently been more successful than poor old Faust in finding a painless way to the secret of eternal youth.
the end of Act Two of Gounod's Faust, the Paris Opera Chorus and Orchestra, conducted by André Cluitens. In that 1959 recording, Faust is sung by Nikolai Geda, Marguerite by Victoria de Los Angeles, Mephistopheles by Boris Kristof, and Valentin by Ernest Blanc. That's on EMI in a box of three mid-price CDs and CDs only, I'm afraid. The number is CMS seven six nine nine eight three. Too. Well, that was John Steen's recommendation for enjoyment, and you may well think that leaves nothing more to be said. But if your priorities are a complete text and a modern recording, and your enjoyment would be spoilt without those, then John also recommends the very latest Faust. The cast is headed by Richard Leach, Cheryl Studer, José Van Damme, and Thomas Hampson, with the French Army Choir and the Toulouse Capitol Chorus and Orchestra, conducted by Michel Plasson. That's on EMI as well at full price. Again, as a box of three CDs only. The number is CDS seven five four two two eight two, and both those numbers will be going up as usual on CFAX in just over twenty minutes' time. But please note that the page numbers changed from this week onwards to six four one page six four one. Incidentally, John Steen will be back later in the morning, just after a quarter to twelve, to tell me about Deutsche Grammophon's newly released Domingo edition. We'll have various short extracts from that, and the whole of a duet from another Guno opera, Romeo and Juliet. In building a library next week, Richard Wigmore will be comparing recordings of Haydn's last two completed string quartets, Opus seventy-seven. And after that, Jeremy Beadle will be reviewing a selection of new releases of operas by Mozart, Richard Strauss, and Sir Michael Tippett. <laughs>